Do you spend hours in your head thinking about something that happened, could have happened, or might happen? Do you ask others what to do so you don't make a mistake? Welcome to the Playing It Safe podcast. I am Dr. Z, your host. I am a clinical psychologist, an author, and a person that is super passionate about sharing with you science-based skills to overcome any type of fear-based struggles. Who doesn't experience fear? Who doesn't play it safe? In this show, we will discuss how fear-based reactions happen in day-to-day life, how playing it safe behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like, how you can put into action solid tips from behavioral science to get unstuck from worries, fears, obsessions, and anxieties, and how you can start doing what works, what matters, and what you care about. Behavioral science doesn't have to be boring. Thanks for listening, and let's get started. What happens when you are very, very concerned about making mistakes? What happens when you hold on to rules about how things are supposed to be? What happens when you feel very disappointed if things go wrong? Do you spend a lot of time making decisions? Do you spend a lot of time working on some projects? In this episode, I chat with Clarissa Ong. Clarissa is an assistant professor and the psychology clinic director at the University of Toledo. Clarissa has co-written two books, a Transdiagnostic Act Manual, Acting Steps, and a self-help book for perfectionism, The Anxious Perfectionist. She is also the director of the Process-Oriented Intervention Science Lab. Her research work focuses on developing and disseminating effective interventions guided by behavioral and process-based principles. In this episode, Clarissa and I chat about how to handle some perfectionistic traits like being hardworking or paying attention to details can be extremely handy. But what happens when you don't do things in moderation and feel compelled to do more and more and to do everything right and avoid mistakes? People that are prone to perfectionism don't do things in moderation because we're afraid of being inadequate, embarrassed, criticized and inferior. And on top of that, sometimes we set impossible high standards for ourselves. We chat about motivational flexibility, uncertainty workouts, the coherent strap that is behind perfectionistic actions, meta-awareness or awareness about awareness, and how you can practice awareness exercises and self-compassion exercises that you can put into action right away. I hope you enjoy this episode. And if you have any questions, please send me an email. You can go to my website, www.thisisdrz.com. I wish you a great week. Bye-bye. I have this beautiful book here. (laughs) I'm going to have it. Yeah, no, congratulations. And as you can see, I have all these pages folded because I read it from the A to the Z. (laughs) That's so nice. I'm glad. I love how personal it is. And I think it had a nice mixture of a personal story and the act processes. So I very much appreciate that. Yeah, it was personal. It's funny because I I think I've also got that comment somewhere else. And I think I have this like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it seemed that personal. I think I just, I think I wrote it basically how I would do therapy. Mm-hmm. Like, so the way that I am in therapy, like written out is basically the book. And, um, and I think, let's see, at the time that we were writing it, I think I was at my last year of grad school and then transitioning to internship. And I think 
every time I like interacted with a client who struggled with perfectionism, I would be like, oh, like, and then I would update like different things that we were talking about. So I feel like it, it's, it's a bit of like an, it was an evolving kind of like me learning how to do therapy better also, I think. Um, but I think Mike and I had kind of figured out like the overall structure, um, like what we wanted to include. And I think once you have like, oh, this is a diffusion chapter, mm-hmm. there are, you know, there are only so many ways to write it. But I think there was a lot of like based on ideas that came up, then then I would sort of write in each chapter. So I think one thing too is there's lots of like um pop culture or media references to different tv shows and it was very much like at the time that's what I was watching (laughs) and then (laughs) a different chapter is like oh I was just finished watching this show and I watched a lot of tv during the pandemic so I like got through all of Breaking Bad so (laughs) it's like Breaking Bad I watched the whole thing of Insecure so I think it's very much in some ways it's like a scrapbook of like my life going from grad school to internship in some ways I love it. I love it. Um, I think it's nice to hear this because writing many times helps us to be better clinicians because we slow down, we're thinking more. Um, now, in the book, there is one section I'm trying to find it here. When yeah. you guys describe the coherent trap. Oh, yeah. 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 So for people who are listening to us, some of them are familiar with ACT, with acceptance and community skills. Some of them are not. How would you describe the coherent trap and how does it relate to high achieving, perfectionistic and striving actions? Yeah, um, so I think when I, I think when we talk about the coherence trap, it's sort of this idea that humans kind of fundamentally seek out coherence in that they want things to make sense. They want stories to make sense. Well, I guess we want stories to make sense. We want that kind of clean, like, you know, um, what is a beginning, middle, end, and there's like a clean like ending with closure. I think humans naturally seek out those sorts of um, narrative patterns. And so the idea that we um, are so, um, we desire coherence so much um, to the point where we may ignore what is actually happening, which is our kind of messy human experiences that tend to be contradictory and incoherent. And Mm -hmm. I think how that relates to perfectionism, I think is the same idea of with perfectionism, there's a lot of rule, like rule following, rule following or rule governed behavior, right? It's like, I should be this way. And then, okay, so that's how it is, or this is what is good for me. And so I do that, right? Like, like working 80 hours a week is good. And then I kind of act as if that's true. And we can even come up with reasons for it. Like working 80 hours a week is good because then I'm being productive. Being productive is good because then I'm being more successful. Being successful is good because everyone wants to be successful, right? And that's mm-hmm. the that's the story making sense. And I think if we were more in tune with our experience, it might say, oh, everyone is telling me this is good and this should make me happy and I am not happy. And that mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. There's like this incongruent kind of, um, context in reality but then because we want things to make sense we kind of keep going like well I'll just need to work harder then it means I'm not working hard enough because that's the only way this will fit the story mm-hmm. right like it means I'm not working hard enough so I think I think that's sort of how I think of it I think it's very interesting within act sometimes we talk about reason giving thoughts right yeah. which is you know another form of rule governed behavior um and I think what happens is that those thoughts many times are resistant to change. We hold on to them with white knuckles. One of the things that we know is that doing things right and perfect can be also very appetitive. We get socially reinforced. It feels good. It feels good to get an A. It feels good to be praised. It feels good to say that we did something according to our standards. Um, for people listening to us, what would you tell them for some of them that say, but it's working? Yeah. Oh, I, I can think of so many things, but mm-hmm. probably like my, one of my first questions would be, what is it working for? Mm-hmm. Or what is it working toward? I think clarifying the, the criteria that you're basing like workability or working on is, is important, right? Because if it's working for 
like I'm getting my promotion or, you know, I'm doing a record number of surgeries that other people are only doing five a week and I'm doing 10, then, then that's fine. And then just asking like, okay, is that like what I want out of life? Because for, first clarifying the goal and then is that a goal that you're intentional and um, care and that what you care about? And then I think if the person is like, yeah, then they're like, okay, great. That means it sounds like things are going exactly as you want. And mm-hmm. I think it's fine. Like it's not, it's we only care about perfectionism or we only consider perfectionism a problem if it's getting in the way of what you want out of life. Right. But if it's helping you get closer to what you want in life and genuinely that's what you want, not because someone told you it's what you mm-hmm. want, then I think that's totally fine. And I'm glad that that's working. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, yeah, but I think I also struggle with that a lot that. Um, the external reinforcement for engaging in perfect, perfectionistic behaviors makes it very tempting to keep falling back into those patterns. Um, to, and, and I think that's very relatable for me. I definitely relate to that too. And I appreciate your flexible response. I think in life we go through cycles or seasons, right? Sometimes we do have to prioritize our careers or writing a book or and other times we prioritize our friendships, we prioritize our family, and we learn to go through those cycles. Now, if I can ask a little bit more, in my work with clients many times, what I have found is that they are very, very in touch with their values. It just happens that they're holding onto the values perhaps in a rigid manner, but they are very clear about what's important to them. And I am one of those people too, that, you know, I know exactly why I'm doing what. Uh, And it's hard. It is hard to let go sometimes. How was the process for you to make this distinction when you push hard, when you step back? Yeah, I think I think like what you're saying earlier too about like there are contexts in which perfectionism helps more than others. Like maybe when you're actively in surgery, yes, be very, very attentive to detail and maybe over prepare. But if you're making dinner for your family, then maybe that's where to let go. Um, and I think with the values kind of struggle, it might be similar. Like there may be times when being rigid is helpful and maybe times when being flexible is helpful. But I think, um, I think there's, I don't know, I think with like with clients who struggle with perfectionism and values, like I often find like that we're in the same problem solving pattern mm-hmm. of like, like, okay, if not success, then values, but then we, then we just replicate that same process of, okay, then how do I find the right value? Now that I have the right value, how do I pursue it in the right way? And even though it's now, you know, formally or content-wise about values, the function doesn't change. And what we really care about is that the function changes. So I, so I think in those contexts, it's like noticing if the person like, oh, are you trying to get your values right? Right. Even in saying, okay, but even if I am flexible, how do I be flexible in exactly the right way? It's like, well, that, so I, I think I usually do something like, I don't know, like you'll figure it out. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like try different ways and then see what, you know, feels congruent to your values based on your experience. But I, I can't, I can't, and you know, I don't think giving you the answer would be helpful, but it's this like pre like, Oh, tell me how to do it. Then I'll do it. And it's like, no, just do it. And that's, I think what's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's driven by uncertainty, right. And the fear of making a decision that I will regret or the fear of being a failure, right? So I love what you're saying that let's see, let's try something different. Let's see how it goes. We do not know. Um, Mm. When you work with your clients and you encourage them to try different ways, will you say that you are encouraging them to do exposures or are you encouraging them to try different ways of doing things without label or framing that as an exposure? What will you say? I I don't usually label it as an exposure, but I think functionally it is an exposure. Like yeah. I think for clients where we kind of have talked through like the anxiety model and like negative reinforcement and how avoidance kind of maintains this cycle, I feel more okay saying exposure because it very much fits their own conceptualization of like why the problem is being maintained. 
Mm -hmm. um but I think if I if there's no yeah but I think if there's no like need to particularly label it that way and the person has a different framework that is working for them I don't usually call it exposure but functionally I do think of it as an exposure it's such an interesting topic I don't talk about exposures in my work with high achievers either and it's because they are really having told hundreds of times that they should let go of their standards, that they should make mistakes when they're sending an email. And every client I work with found those messages very alienating. Um, mm. But I talk about uncertainty workouts. Let's see how we can try something new without any attachment of how it should be or how it should feel or how you should behave. So I frame as uncertainty workouts and encourage a lot of openness, how we can practice curiosity. So like you, functionally speaking, yeah, it's an exposure. But I think that many times we think that when people are dealing with high achieving behaviors, you have to jump quickly into asking them to make an error, to do less. And I know for myself that has been very alienating and you know, for my clients, many times they didn't go into therapy because of that, because they were afraid they were going to be asked to do less. Yeah. And thanks for sharing that perspective. I don't, I can see how, you know, like, oh, you're perfectionistic, make mistakes. It feels like a kind of oversimplification of like what is going on for the person. Uh, I think you're right. Sometimes we may overly simplify that there are other processes like this fear of being a failure, fear of not being good enough, uh, self-criticism, right? But yeah. if I can ask a little bit more, let me switch gears. In your book, you also talk about awareness of awareness, like a meta-awareness. Yeah. Uh, do you mind sharing a little bit more about that? Oh, how can yeah. you put that into practice in their day-to-day life oh yeah so I think when we we're talking about that um we we're talking about in the context of like noticing when your mind is wandering and then sort of gently bringing it back to whatever you want to focus on so it's just this idea of like being aware when you're drifting or also I guess being aware of when you're focused mm-hmm. um I think I think that's honestly like to me that's a really difficult still to practice because like yeah like being aware that you're not aware seems almost like inherently like you know difficult Um, (laughs) and I think I don't know so I think a lot of people I'm sure meditation would be helpful and I think a lot of people can recommend that I tend to prefer like more like I don't know what I might call it but maybe like quote active mindfulness where it's like I'm doing something I care about and Mm -hmm. then catching I'm distracted and I think that often occurs in interpersonal situations like I'm talking Mm -hmm. to a friend and all of a sudden I'm thinking about my to-do list or I'm talking about a friend I'm thinking about that email that I got that I checked my phone like three minutes ago Mm -hmm. that I shouldn't actually have checked my phone in the first place and I think so I'm like okay catch myself and then being very intentional about like okay I got distracted and bring myself back and so I think I personally I practice a bit more informally and I I think I think of it like it's just a muscle Mm -hmm. so any chance you get to practice keep practicing Mm -hmm. eventually you'll get better I think there's a part in the book and Mike actually Mike was the one who added this part of you know if you're practicing something like two times a day even though it doesn't seem like that many over a week, that's 14 times. And over a month, that's like 50 something times. And like, it adds up over time. And if you're doing it consistently and intentionally, I can't imagine that you won't get better. That's right. I don't remember the author or the writer, but he talks about the 1%, making every day a 1% change, right? Like every single day taking a micro step. Mm. And if I can ask a little bit more, how do you see the relationship between high achieving behaviors and awareness about awareness? Why is that important? I think it kind of goes back to the, well, I guess there are two ways. Like one, I think it goes back to the idea that generally in perfectionism, there's a lot of different types of rigidity, but especially cognitive and attentional rigidity, Mm -hmm. right? So if we're very 
caught up in rules, we're pretty disconnected from our lived experience. Right? It's hard to sort of be following rules and still be attuned to direct um, contingencies or our lived environment. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think that's one aspect that the awareness of awareness means that you have to be pretty present to be aware that these things are happening. So I think that's one aspect. I think the second aspect is I think a lot of times, oh, I don't know if I say a lot, but I think commonly with people who are high achieving, there's this sense of like, put your head down and, and keep working and like keep kind of toiling away. And it's it's kind of like if you go for a hike and you're just like looking at your feet the whole time, mm -hmm. like making sure you don't step on anything, you know, like, but like the, the entire hike, you're not like looking around and seeing like that you're elevate, you know, you're getting higher elevation that the view changes from like maybe a forest to a more like exposed area. Um, and I think the awareness of awareness lets you catch first, like, oh, I'm not paying attention to the things around me, and then gives you that chance to pivot, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're not aware that you're distracted, you'll just stay in that mode by default. That's right. And I think there's a lot of default kind of going on, right? Like, oh, okay, yeah, just keep working. Just keep checking emails. That's right. And I'm curious what you guys found in your research. You just mentioned that there is a lot of attention rigidity and cognitive rigidity. Yeah. That's something you found in the study that you guys did. Um, which one? There are a couple of papers that you guys publish on perfectionists after delivering an eight or 10 week protocol. And the other paper is looking at neuropsychological functioning. Okay, I think, yeah. yeah. I'm curious, is this description that there is more attention rigidity and cognitive rigidity is coming from one of the studies that you guys did? I don't think we actually examined it as specifically enough to be able to say that. I think I say that more based on like anecdote, anecdotally, um, but we did, we actually did just publish a study where we tested a specific like cognitive flexibility and motivational flexibility modules, self-help modules targeting cognitive and motivational rigidity and perfectionism. Wow, that's fascinating. If I can unpack that a little bit more, you mentioned that you're also looking at motivational flexibility. Yeah. Can you describe it, how it looks, if it's possible, so we can get a preview of the paper? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think that one was kind of interesting for us too, to like really define it. Um, so the way we thought about motivational rigidity and perfectionism is basically pliance, that mm. the reason that people do things is maybe 80% um, because I should, slash <laughs> because I don't want this bad thing to happen, um, which I guess is not technically pliance, but it's, there's only aversive control and rule following for, mm -hmm. the, for the most part. And when we think of motivational flexibility is can you connect with other sources of motivation? So for example, values would be one, but then there's also like pros and cons. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I think a more MI kind of approach, motivational interviewing kind of approach. So allowing people to connect with different reasons for doing things, I think was the idea of motivational flexibility that, you know, like if I have to wake up at 7 a.m. to catch the bus, maybe that's just rule. I'm just going to follow that rule and not even think about it. And that works. Mm -hmm. But when I'm thinking about how do I want to spend my vacation, maybe then I might be guided more by my values rather than, well, if I go to, you know, um, Boston, then I have to go see, I have to do the duck tours or like, I have to go do this thing. Mm -hmm. And so again, like, connecting with different motivational outlets and strategies depending on the context I think was the idea that's really cool and when you guys were doing this research and you see a shift in motivational flexibility did you guys find any particular process from acceptance and commitment therapy that facilitates that or mediates that uh no I think that was one mm -hmm. of the weaknesses that we didn't get sufficient precision to determine Exactly, because how we did it was we actually gave an intro that was like, we're going to teach you a couple of different tools mm -hmm. and use them when it works, right? So for the cognitive one, we did diffusion and restructuring. And so we actually, I don't think we were able to tease apart like, oh, because you did diffusion or because you did restructuring. I think we were more concerned about that meta level of, did you know when to use diffusion and did you know when to use restructuring and did you do that in ways that work for you to deal with your thoughts 
That's a very interesting study. I can't wait to read the paper. Um, one more question about perfectionism, if it's okay. In the book, you guys tap into self-compassion. Do you mind sharing any tips or any insights for people listening to us? We know that one of the things that happens with high achieving behaviors is that there is a lot of self-criticism because we made a mistake, we made an error, we dropped the ball on something and the mind quickly goes into judge judgy mode. And sometimes people stay hours on self-criticism. Yeah, uh, I think self-compassion is really dicey because it is, I think, really difficult for people, including myself, and that's why I can say that. But I think a couple of things with self-compassion that have helped me and I think I've shared with some of my clients is that it's not a feeling, and it's not, con- and it's unconditional. Mm-hmm. Right? That's not like I have to earn self compassion or I have to feel like I love myself. Self compassion is something you do, just like brushing your teeth, just like putting on clothes in the morning, just like making coffee. And I think being able, for me, being able to hold that conceptualization of self compassion makes it more accessible. Because if the if the barrier is, oh, I have to love myself or feel loving feelings for myself first, it's like, I'm never going to get there. Right. So I think that's one thing. I love that. I think sometimes we think that we have to feel something to be self-compassionate, right? Then we can watch a lot of TV waiting for that feeling. I know. <laughs> right? We can watch yeah. another round of Breaking Bad. <laughs> I know, exactly. Many, okay. many rounds, yeah. And then... I think the second thing too is um, to be really creative in what self-compassion can look like. It's like, so for for me, one of my like most helpful self-compassion things is just saying no. Uh That's like my self, my kind of self-compassionate move. It's when someone asks me to do something and I say no, Uh Uh, or making sure I go to bed before a certain time. Like to me, like that's like what I consider self-compassion. Mm-hmm. Or like if I'm at the store so I have this thing where I don't like buying avocados because they're so expensive <laughs> and I only buy them they're on sale <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense they're pricey even if they're, they're, really expensive. Expensive. they're pricey I know <laughs> yeah and then like letting myself buy an avocado would be my like self-compassion <laughs> you know like just that it can show up in so many forms but we always think of it like oh it's a spa day or oh I'm gonna have brunch And it feels like, oh, I'm going on a trip or I'm going to do a staycation. And it actually can show up in so many different ways. And I think that also is helpful for me. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I love the examples that if we are creative, we can find so many ways to practice some kind or gentle behavior with ourselves. Thank you for Mm -hmm. sharing that. And I hope people can really, really keep that in mind. I have one last question for you. Okay. Uh, and this is not related to perfectionistic actions. <laughs> if you were to have a chance to have a cup of tea or coffee or a beer with any person you want today, who would that be and why? And it can be any person. I So I remember the last time that we talked um, for this podcast, you asked me that. Um, no, it's and, a classic question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like the like kind of defining question for your show. Um, and I think um, I think it would probably just be like um, one of my old friends um, from from Utah, and I think just because it feels so hard to meet people. I mean, partly because of the like even before living in different states makes it hard to meet people, but the pandemic definitely made it worse. And I think if I could just snap my fingers and have someone be able to show up, I think it would be one of those people. But um, yeah, my, they're my friends from Utah. And I think if I could meet any one of them, that would, I would be really happy. Um, I haven't seen them in a very long time. That's special to have a moment to chat with the ones that matter to us and the ones we love. I hope you guys can get together soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much. This has been very special. I think this is going to be a very helpful conversation for people. And if people want to find more about your work, where can they find you? I guess Google Scholar would be my, my social okay. media page, technically. There we go. Okay, so Google is Scholar. And then I will put a link for the book, The Anxious Perfectionist, How to Manage Perfectionist, Driven Anxiety, Using Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Thank you so much. 
Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, I will very much appreciate it if you will subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. And if you're feeling extra generous, I welcome a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes of this episode are in the website playingitsafe.com. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter so you can receive more tips to stop all types of unworkable playing it safe actions. See you soon.